in our continuing study of answering the religious errors of our family, friends, and neighbors, we're looking at what we find that so often may be spoken of concerning baptism, and that is that sprinkling and pouring is considered by many to be baptism. And so that's what we're looking at in our study tonight because it is a very common practice in the religious world. For instance, the Church of the Nazarene manual says that baptism may be administered by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion according to the choice of the applicant. So they leave it up to the person being, quote, baptized as to whether they want to be sprinkled, poured, or immersed. In the Luther's small catechism, it stated, what is the meaning of the word baptize? Baptize means to apply water by washing, pouring, sprinkling, or immersion. Looking at the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is the Presbyterian uh, creed, dipping of the person into the water is not necessary. The baptism is rightly administered by pouring or sprinkling water upon the person. And one other one, the catechism, the Catholic catechism, how is baptism given? It's given by pouring water over the forehead of the person to be baptized. So these are the creeds or the manuals. And you know, the interesting thing that I have found down through the years is that for the most part, mainstream denominational churches have written creeds. And it's interesting when you talk to people that are members of those mainstream denominations, they have no concept that these books exist. No concept whatsoever. It's, it's just something that they do not and are completely unaware of. And yet they may have been a part of that denomination for their whole lives and maybe they are what they are because of their parents. So we quote from these and these are the official uh, documents that these denominations use and they're the ones that depending on the denomination, whether they abridge them, whether they renew them, or whether they have conventions or councils on whatever uh, regularity that they will make adjustments to these. But so many of them do have them in written form as, as we're looking and seeing here. So this is what we see, as we've said, that sprinkling or pouring for baptism is a common practice in the religious world. What we see also is that baptism or baptize and its various forms, whether it's baptize, baptizing, or any other of the forms of the word baptize, is a word that was not translated from the original Greek language. We know the New Testament by inspiration written by the apostles and prophets were written in the Greek language. And in the translation, the word baptize never got translated. What we see happened is that each letter in the Greek word baptize is given the English equivalent of what actually alphabet corresponds to in the Greek. So to better see this, this is the word baptize in the Greek. These are the Greek letters that make up the word baptize. And of course, we're familiar with our English word, baptism. Well, what they did was that they took the equivalent of the Greek letter and put it into the English on each of these Greek letters. They were, trans they were not translated, they were just simply carried over into the English letter for letter. Whatever the Greek word was, the English equivalent word was used. So the word baptize 
in our English Bibles is not a translated word. In fact, instead, it's what's called a transliteration. And it's just that. It's to represent or to spell in the same characters of another language alphabet. And that's what we saw there in the pictorial we had just a moment ago. When we look at the word translate, the word translate means to give the meaning of the word from one language. To another. So I hope we see the difference between a transliteration where you're just swapping letters equivalent from one language to another. Whereas in translate, you're given the meaning of the word in the original to put it into the language that you are intending to make use of. So what that tells us is, baptize is not a translated word. It's not a translated word into the English language. And that being the case, if the word had been translated, then what would it be? What would be the translation of the word baptize? Well, Vine tells us that baptisma consists of the processes of emotion. And then he says it's submotion and emotion. That is the putting under and the bringing forth. Submerge and emerge. Thayer says it properly means to dip repeatedly, to emerge or submerge, to cleanse by dipping or submersion, to wash, to make clean with water. And he uses Luke 11 and verse 38. And that was where the scribes and the Pharisees were rebuking Jesus and his disciples because they did not wash their hands before they ate bread. And yet metamorphically, it means overwhelmed. And one other one, Strong's, says that baptize means to immerse, submerge, to make overwhelmed, for instance, fully wet, used only in the New Testament, especially of the ordinance of Christian baptism. Well, these are the dictionary and the lexicon definitions. What I want us, as we always do in this study, is to see what it is that the scriptures teach. In regard to sprinkling and pouring, as many people think, is baptism. What is it that the scriptures teach? The scriptures teach baptism is a burial. We know that from Romans chapter 3. Come to bread and read this verses, Romans 6, I'm sorry. Come on, read this verses 3 and 4. For you should not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. All right, notice what's stated here in Romans 6. He says we are buried with him. There's your definition of baptizing. We're buried with him through baptism. So the act of burying is in conjunction with baptism. So even if we did not have Thayer and, and uh, Vine and Strong and all of the other lexicons, the authorities that give us definition of Greek words, the Bible itself gives us the definition. And here in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, we see it. So notice that it says, we are buried, we are baptized into his death. 
So we know that Jesus died. He died upon the cross. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism. Jesus was buried. And it says, just as Christ was raised from the dead. So see, here we have in context of baptism, the parallel that Paul is describing by inspiration is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so in giving us that parallel, he's saying that we are dead, not physically, we are dead in sin. Death is separation. That's what death, sin does. It separates us from God. So we are dead in sin, but we are to be buried with him, with Christ, through baptism. So baptism to us is that burial in order that then we may raise to walk in the newness of life. And that newness of life is because our sins have been forgiven. So, this is what we have being described. And then we'll, we'll look at verse 17 in Romans 6 a little bit later on in our study. Another verse that gives us the definition where the, the scriptures defines for us the word baptize is Colossians chapter 2. Someone read this verse 11 and 12. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. There for him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So see, we see basically the same language, the same description of things given here in Colossians 2 than what we have in Romans 6. We have the statement that we are putting off the body of sin. So that means that we're putting off the body. The body is dead because of sin. We then are buried with him. Same phrase of what we have in Romans 6. We are buried with Christ in baptism. And we are raised with him through faith in the working of God. And that is corresponding with the fact that just as God raised Jesus from the dead, so his death, burial, resurrection, our death, burial, and resurrection. But there has to be baptism involved in order for our being buried to be that which is with or through Christ. We're buried with him through baptism. Now this word buried, to just give it a general dictionary definition, it means to conceal by or as if by covering with earth, to place a dead body in a grave, a tomb, or the sea, to cover from view. That's the American Heritage Dictionary. Now, we can see this burial that's spoken of in both Romans and Colossians. We can see the definition of buried when we look at the examples that we have of those that were engaged in baptism, them going into the water. Someone read us Matthew 3, verse 16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on the throne. All right, notice Jesus came up immediately from the water. So we see what buried is. He's now, he's been emerged now. I mean, he's been submerged. Now he's emerging. He is coming up from the water. I right, let's look at John 3. Someone read this verse 23. Now John also was baptizing in the Jordan, and behold, there was much water there. 
Okay, John, we know, was baptizing. John, the immersive. That's another one of those places where that if they had if they had translated the word baptize, it would not have been John the Baptist. It would have been John the Immerser. So John was the Immerser. And we see that he baptized where he did. Why? Because there was much water there, indicating that it takes more to to baptize a person than what amount of water it would take if we were only sprinkling or pouring water upon a person. To bury someone is going to take a greater volume of water. And that's what we see John making, John the Apostle making reference to here in reference to John the Emotion. Here he was baptizing and he was baptizing there because there was much water. Let's look at Acts 8 and verse 38. Someone read. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. All right. Here we see the case of Philip preaching to the Ethiopia, and we find that. They came to this certain water, and the eunuch asked the question, here's water, what hinders me to be baptized? And so when Philip said, if you believe, and the eunuch stated that which he believed, then he commanded the chariot to stand still, and he says both, Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. So there is the going down into the water, which is what would be required in order to submerge and in order to emerge. And that's what constitutes baptism. And so here are the examples we have of what bury means, them going into the water. Now, if sprinkling and pouring is what some people say constitutes baptism. The other thing that we see that the scriptures teaches is that sprinkling and pouring are not the same as emotion. Remember those creeds that we read from a moment ago? They listed all three, sprinkling, pouring, emotion. The applicant could decide or that it was not necessary to emerge uh, submerged, but rather that sprinkling and pouring could be administered. So sprinkling and pouring are not the same as emotion, and here's why. Ask the question, what is baptized? That may seem like a far too simple question to be asking in this subject, but it's a, very, it's a very important question. What is baptized? Well, in Acts 8, someone read us the 12th verse. When they believed Philip, they preached. Things came to pass as they went along, and they continued to Christ, both men and women were baptized. All right. Who were baptized? Men and women. Men and women were baptized. Now, what is sprinkled? Water. Water is sprinkled. And what we mean by sprinkled, it means to scatter, it means to disperse in small drops. So in sprinkling, it's the water that's sprinkled. In Emotion, it's the people that are being emotion. Same holds true for poured. Again, what is poured? Well, water is what's being poured. Because, and to, to pour simply means to cause to flow in a stream. So just this question of what is baptized is very important. 
Because when it comes to sprinkling and pouring, we're talking strictly about the water, and that's what we must take notice about. Sprinkling has as its direct object water. Pouring has as its direct object water. Emotion has as its direct object the person. You pour water, you sprinkle water, you don't immerse water. You sprinkle water, you pour water, you immerse a person. And that's what we see in Acts 8 and verse 12. So, we must conclude that sprinkling and pouring are completely different things than emotion. And we see what the, what the scriptures define to be baptism. Baptism is a burial. It is emotion. I just look at the questions. How does Romans 6, 4, and verse 17 in the entire context, in fact, Answer, help, answer, help us answer the question of whether emotion is demanded. You know, is it really up to the person that's about to be baptized as to how they want to be, whether it's sprinkled for or emotion? Is there an option here? So how would we use Romans 6, verse 4 and verse 17? Let's look at verse, and let me go back. Let me look, let's read verse 4 and verse 17, some man for us. Therefore, we will marry for them for I right, notice what we have. We we've, we've looked at this already, but let's make sure we understand what is being said here in Romans six and verse four. We are buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. When Paul went on in that 17th verse, he said, God be thanked that you were the slaves of sin, yet you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. That form of doctrine refers back to what he was talking about in verse 4. See, in this passage, we see it's a burial, and Paul is drawing his parallel between our being buried with Christ through baptism into his death, burial, and resurrection. So that's what our obedience to the gospel needs to do, just like the Romans, that you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. We know what a form is. Anybody that works with concrete, any ladies that, Still make dresses, you have a pattern. If you're pouring concrete, you build a form, and whatever shape you want to make it, you build a form that corresponds to that, so that when you pour the concrete, it will take on that form. Same with the dress pattern. You lay the paper down on the material, you cut the material according to the pattern. And what you will have is the form that will result in the dress that you make. So Paul says that the Romans had obeyed from the heart that form. And that form or that pattern that they had obeyed was like Christ died, as Christ was buried, and as Christ was resurrected. Our obedience to the gospel took on that same form. We were dead in sin. We were buried with him in baptism. We were raised to walk in the newness of life. So 
that helps us to see emotion is demanded. It's not an option to be thrown in with sprinkling and pouring because there's nothing in the scriptures that allows, justifies, or authorizes baptism being where water is sprinkled or where water is poured upon a person. So this parallel that we are seeing here in Romans 4 is that form of doctrine. And again, just as Jesus died, was buried, and then raised, we are dead in sin, buried in baptism, and raised to walk in a new life because we have had our sins washed away in the blood of Christ. Any comments or questions on question number one? Okay, number two. Well, let, let's look at these and make sometimes uh, pictures, as they say, is worth a thousand words. Here's what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter six. This is what he's saying when here is what Christ did, and when we obey from the heart, our obedience will take on that very same form of which Christ went through. So the gospel is reenacted in baptism. And that 17th verse in Romans chapter 6 is, is also very important to show the necessity, the, the fact that baptism is immersion, and that is what is demanded in order for it to be baptism, to be able to take on this form of which Paul is talking about. Okay, number two, what is transliteration, and how does it differ from translation? What do we say about transliteration? Right. Transliteration is to represent or spell in the characters of another language's alphabet. We're dealing with letter for letter when we deal with a transliteration. The original Greek word was given its English equivalent word. Letter for letter. It wasn't translated. It was just simply carried over from the Greek into the English. And so, it's a letter for letter rendering of the Greek word. That's what we have in most of our English translations. The King James, the New King James, the American Standard, the New American Standard, the English Standard, it's just a transliterated word brought over from the original Greek word. But what do we mean by translate? What does that mean? What do you do when you translate something? Ah, you give it the meaning. Translate is to give the meaning of the word from what it meant in one language to what it means in another language. So what it meant in the Greek, if it had been translated, it would have been emotion because that's the word that corresponds with the Greek word meaning. So that's the difference, and it's a, it's, it's a major difference, and it's, again, one of those things you don't understand how that has happened that way that just happened to be one of those words, of all words, <laughs> that, that just got transliterated and not translated. And so, again, a picture is worth a thousand words. Here is the Greek word for baptize or baptism. Here is our English word. And so in a transliteration, we have the rendering of the Greek letter B 
into the English alphabet, B. Same with the word A, same with the word P, same with the word T, I, S, and M. It's not a translated word. It's just simply brought over from the Greek into the English. So we need to keep that in mind when we understand this word baptism that's so frequently used in the New Testament. If it had been translated, as we've seen in our study, it would have been immersed. And that's what the word, or bury, as we find in Romans 6 and Colossians 2. What does baptism mean? What did we say vine defined it to be? All right. Emotion involves two things. To emerge something involves submersion, that is, putting it under, and emerging, bringing it out, bringing it from. So that's what we see concerning emotion. Two things are involved. There is the putting under that results in the burial, and then there's the bringing forth. And we see that in Romans 6 and verse 4 with Jesus' death and resurrection. We are burial and resurrection. We see that in our obedience to the gospel, in being buried in baptism and being raised to walk in the newness of life. We see a submersion and an emotion. Because that's what it takes for there to be a motion, a burial. And of course, we see that definition in the conversion of the Ethiopian unit that we read a moment ago. Brother George was telling me before services, um, I mean, uh, Brother Sutton was in a debate on baptism. Uh, many years ago, and I also was aware of another debate where, of course, the person was arguing in favor of sprinkling for baptism, and he used Acts 8 and the conversion of the unit to supposedly prove his point, and his point was that as the context of Philip going to meet up with the Ethiopian, the Bible says that it was a desert place. Well, he took the meaning of the word desert to mean dry, barren, no water. Of course, the word desert in that verse simply means deserted. No houses, no towns, it's just simply a place out in the middle of nowhere. But anyway, that was his definition of desert. It was a dry, barren place where there could not possibly have been very much water. So when Philip joined himself to the chariot and preached to him Jesus, and the eunuch said, see, here is water, this fellow said that what the eunuch was doing, he was pointing to a jug of water because he was on a long trip. He had a jug of water with him in the chariot. And that's what Philip, uh, Philip used to baptize the unit, was the water that was in that jug, which, of course, he thought proved the point concerned, and really all that was accomplished on that conversion was the sprinkling of water. But the gospel preacher was very quick to show that that statement that we're seeing here, that Philip, and the eunuch, both Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water. That that would have been a little bit hard to do in a mason jar, wouldn't it? So, so there's all kinds of attempts sometimes that are made in efforts to justify whatever a person believes. 
but we just simply have to stick with what the scriptures teach. And when we do that, we'll have the truth and only the truth in the matter. And of course, Strong's definition is to emerge, to submerge. That's what baptism is. And how does baptism, number three, of the eunuch answer the question of what is sprinkling on the point is scriptural? It said down in verse 38, they went down into the water and he baptized them. If sprinkling and pouring a baptism, what would be the need to go down into the water? See, that's what we have them doing. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. If there had been no need for them to go down into the water, if sprinkling or pouring was the action that Philip was performing upon the eunuch. And we see that going down into the water, just not only with this conversion, we see it at Jesus' baptism. And we also saw it there when we <clears throat> looked at the baptism of John, where it was taking place, where there was much water. And then a final question. Explain the difference in the action on the person and the action on the water and how that addresses the question of whether sprinkling or pouring is a form of baptism. See, we talked about how that with immersion, we're immersing the person. The action taking place is on the person. But when we talk about sprinkling or pouring, the action is on the water. We're sprinkling the water. We're pouring the water. But we're not immersing the water. We're immersing the person. So men and women are being baptized. That's what we read in Acts 8 and verse 12 a moment ago. We see where the action is taking place. It's taking place on the person. We don't immerse the water. You immerse the person. In sprinkling, you sprinkle the water. The person's not sprinkled. The water is sprinkled. Neither is, so we see the action is in the water. It's not the person. And the same is true when it comes to pouring. You pour the water. The person is not poured. The water is poured. But the water can't be immersed. The person is immersed. So we see where the action is. When we look at these three things that people think in their minds constitute baptism, emotion, sprinkling, and pouring, only one of those three can be done on the person. The other is being action done on the water. And the, and the scriptures are very clear who is the recipients of being immersed? Men and women were being baptized. They were being immersed. So that's something that maybe would help us to think about and keep in our minds and remember when we should happen to run across a person who maybe you talking to them about obeying the gospel and here's the statement they'll make. Well, I've already been baptized. And it could be like the, the, the lesson that we looked at last week. I was baptized when I was a baby. <laughs> so, there, you know, we've already studied that concerning infant baptism. Or they could say, well, you know, I, I've already been baptized. Uh, I went somewhere and, and, and I was sprinkled. Well, that is going to be the opportunity for us to give a defense because that's the thing about the scriptures. We are to give a defense. We are to stand in defense of error when it comes to the truth. But at the same time, when we have the opportunity, we need to be on the offense, not just always on the defense. But we need to take the truth and teach it. 
So let us contend earnestly for the faith. But at the same time, let us always stand ready to give a defense, to give answer for the reason of the hope that is in us. Lord willing, next Wednesday evening we'll be looking, we're still going to be on the subject of baptism because there's a, there's a world of, of, of stuff that goes on with baptism, the subject of baptism. But next week, Lord willing, we're going to be looking at the fact that some people believe that you can be baptized for the dead. And so that's what we hope to look at in next week's study. Any comments, any questions? I appreciate very, very much your attention. And we will turn the services over to singing. What's next on the list, Gary? Okay. All right.